Willkommen, meine Freunde, to our 44th trip to the misty country of a far distant past. This time to the week ending 18th of July, 1965. At number 10, the base of which this entire list is built, is Pride by Ray Brown and the Whispers. The Whispers were a Sydney-based band who were at the harder edge of the rock scene in 1965 at least, until the Easy Beats came along and Brown was a hard-working, charismatic frontman. He was also one of the early advocates of the Gibb Brothers, using them as backup singers on a few of their hits. The band broke up in 1966 and Brown then had a few hits on his own. Sadly, he died while enjoying a game of pool at his home in 1996. Number 9 is Normie Rowe, Australia's biggest pop star in the mid-1960s and his version of George Gershwin's It Ain't Necessarily So. Rowe was an incredible hit maker with 8 top 10s in just over 18 months before he was conscripted to go to Vietnam where he drove armoured personnel carriers. His career as a pop idol never got back on track, but club work and later live theatre and TV ensured he kept working. Rowe had to endure a lot of personal tragedies in the 70s, his daughter's drug problem and his son being killed, but he remained in work all through the period and became a vocal advocate for veterans' rights. Definitely the most famous incident in his later career was an on-air punch-up with shock jock Ron Casey over some insulting comments Casey had made about Vietnam veterans. Years later they reconciled and made an amusing TV ad that spoofed the incident. Well, he still works the corporate circuit and TV and has a special place in the legend of Australian popular music. Number eight is what might be the high point of Gene Pitney's career, the tense, dramatic, almost Orbison-esque last chance to turn around, featuring huge, soaring, double-tracked harmonies on the chorus. This was as good as it got for GP, eventually checking out of the charts a few weeks later, but to me it remains one of the very best made records of the 1960s. Seven is, as the young people would say these days, problematic. Herman's Hermit's version of the late, great Sam Cooke's Wonderful World. While this is the perfect song for Herman's Hermit's featherweight pop and is utterly forgettable 10 seconds after it finishes playing, which is not entirely a bad thing for top 40 pop, I've always thought the only person who can do Sam Cooke is Sam Cooke, except maybe Aretha Franklin. Otis tried, but his style and Sam's were too different. And anything else, well, you might as well listen to Sam, frankly. Not a bad cover, but in a world where it's very hard to do a good one, this one isn't a standout. It's the Beach Boys at number six at their sunniest and most joyful with Help Me Rhonda, a song that proves as a vocalist there was nothing Mike Love could do that Al Jardine couldn't do better. This is the second version of the song. The inferior version, known as the Fannie Mae version, was on the Beach Boys today, which kind of grows on you. And then there's this one. The song hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100, making it the Beach Boys' second number one hit, and it got to number three here, spreading happiness wherever it went. Time for our newest segment, Hello and Goodbye, which tracks the songs entering and exiting the top ten this week. In at nine, up from twelve, comes It Ain't Necessarily So by Normie Row, which was bound for number three, and a five-week joint in the top ten, and Wonderful World by Herman's Hermits, which came up from 13 to its peak of number 7 and had a three-week run at the lofty end of the charts. Leaving the top 10 this week is Mission Bell by PJ Proby, down from 8 to 11 after five weeks in the 10, which saw it peak at 6, and a two-week number 1, A World of Our Own by The Seekers, a song written by Dusty Springfield's brother Tom, which spent seven weeks in the top 10 and actually shared the top 10 spotlight with their previous number 1, I'll Never Find Another You, written also by Tom Springfield. The next number 1 record was in the top 10 this week. In fact, it's the next record in our countdown. The next number 1 after that is at number 30 this week, and it spent seven weeks at the top. Can you guess what it might be? And at number five is what will become next week the only number one that the man Australian music historian Ian McFarlane called the unassailable monarch of Aussie rock. And I'm inclined to agree. Mr Billy Thorpe with I Told the Brook. Thorpe alternated between teen idol crooning like this and the hardest pre-Easy Beach rock we had in Australia, which bagged him eight top ten hits before he reinvented himself as a long-haired, blues-rocking purveyor of ear-splitting volume in the early 70s. At number four, it's our old chum Cliff Richard with Angel, 
a song that originally appeared in the not entirely terrible Elvis film, Follow That Dream. It should be said at this point that Cliff was actually a better actor than Elvis. As a song, it's not entirely terrible, but it's no jailhouse rock, if you know what I mean. In at number three is, to my mind of thinking, one of the most bizarre hits ever in my hometown, Brendan Boyer's The Hucklebuck. The song that first saw the light of day in 1949 had been recorded by Roy Milton, Tommy Dorsey, Earl Hooker, Frank Sinatra and inevitably Chubby Checker. This version was the biggest seller of 1965 and the 40th biggest hit all time locally. It never made number one, it got no higher than number three, but it stayed in the top ten until the last week of September and finally left the chart a month after that, after 19 weeks. My question is, why was it such a big hit? It saw eight number one hits come and go during its chart run. Records like Help, I Got You Babe, and The Eve of Destruction. Records which shaped the 60s, as well as I Can't Get No Satisfaction, Mr. Tambourine Man, Like a Rolling Stone, and Unchained Melody, which all made the top three and left an indelible mark in the pop consciousness. And yet, the Hucklebuck, not a bad record by any means, although it must be said the band is better than the singer, particularly the saxophone player, that is 10 years past its stylistic sell-by date should outsell all of these great records. As the great sage of our time Madonna once said, life is a mystery. At number two is one of those era-defining records, Mr. Tambourine Man, the record which started the folk rock trend, which was a dominant force for the next 18 months and unleashed Bob Dylan upon the wider world. Written by Dylan on a drunken road trip from New York to California, during which Dylan also first heard the Beatles, it's always been a lovely song, and while the West Coast session men, Roger McGuinn is the only member of the Birds who plays on this, do a fine job of electrifying the jingle jangle, and the band's harmonies are a sun-kissed Californicopia, McGuinn's slurry vocal does detract a little. The B-side, Gene Clark's I'll Feel A Whole Lot Better, is, if anything, an even better record. Mark Twain once said, you get your facts first and you can distort them as you please. That's the motto of our upcoming segment, Fowl's Fantastic World of Facts. Biggest rise of this week is the wonderful Hollies with I'm Alive, written by Clint Ballard Jr., who also wrote Linda Ronstadt's hit You're No Good, Good Timing for Jimmy Jones, and The Game of Love for the Mind Menders. I'm Alive rose nine spots to number 16. This week's chart pariah was She's About a Mover by the Sir Douglas Quintet, down from 16 to 28. Highest debutante at 20 is the Rockin' She So Fine by the Easy Beats, their second top 40 hit, which was on its way to number three. And the longest lasting record on the charts was Ticket to Ride by the Beatles, entering its 14th week after five weeks at number one. In the USA, the number one was The Stones with Satisfaction, a record that never made number one here on the local charts. And in the jolly old UK, the birds had the top spot with Mr. Tambourine Man. Number one album in town was almost inevitably the Sound of Music soundtrack at the near beginning of its epic 76 week off again on again run at the top. Time to unveil the number one hit for this week and how can we even think of doing that without uncaging our favourite manic monkey Monty. So here he is, go ahead on Monty, play us in. It's the king baby. Elvis is in full-on gospel mode with crying in the chapel enjoying the fourth of its five weeks at number one. A journeyman song which had kicked around in numerous versions, none of which were hits. Even Elvis passed on it for his 1960 album His Hand in Mine. It was released as a standalone single in 1965 and became Elvis's first million seller since Return to Sender three years before. What a mighty week that was. I do so hope you enjoyed it and will join me in the future, in that most foreign of countries, the past.